All right, everybody. Hey, we are back and getting rock and rolling now. Um, excited to have this guy come on and share some great stuff with us here at the Mass Media Podcast. This guy has done some great stuff besides just being an all-around awesome, badass marketer, all right? This guy has actually done some big things. He's like getting 26 books published before he turns 22, you know, like just absolutely, I mean, that's just an, an amazing thing. Now, Mark is the host of the Breakthrough Success Podcast, just graduated college, uh, an icon at New Media Summit, and a great mar- a digital entrepreneur and marketing expert. And we've had so many people throughout the weekend talk about, hey, you may need a book, or you have a book, or putting things done. I want to bring somebody who does it and puts us all to shame. And so uh, Mark <laughs> Gaberti is joining us from New York today. Mark, welcome to the Mass Media Podcast Summit. And I'm so ready to, to listen to you. Just, just feed us how you do what you're doing, man. Scott, it is a pleasure to be on the summit. I love your enthusiasm. I'm ready to get into it. All right, good. But well, hey, I will drop off here. Do you want to, uh, as people have questions like going through fives, do you want to jump in and a- answer them as they go or wait till the very end? Um, it might be better if we wait until the end, but if there's like a big stream, you know, but okay, I'd rather wait to the end. We'll do, brother. All right, sounds good. All right. So let me just share my screen. Play those books behind you. I mean, that's just awesome, dude. <laughs> Thank you. All right. You able to see that? Just so I yes, make sir. sure. Looking good. All right, sweet. So, um, pretty much what I've been able to do is write 26 books before graduating college, before turning 22. I'm going to get into how I was able to do that, some different ways you can write more books, and a little bit on the business side of books also. So, if you want one of these all encompassing sessions, all around books, this is going to be the session for you. So you may be wondering, why would you want to write that many books? Like 26 books isn't for everyone, but there are a few reasons for it. One of them is that you have the ability of repeat customers. And pretty much for repeat customers is you have like $3 books or $4 books. You're going to have more people likely to buy like three copies, four copies, five copies if they like what you're doing. And each book is a journey with the reader that can turn into a lot more later. Writing that many books also gives you a better idea of what your audience likes. So if you write a book and it doesn't do well, that's an indicator that it's not necessarily going to be the best fit for your audience. Another thing to think about is each book launch is just going to have your future book launches be even better. So your first book launch, for a lot of people, it's not going to be the best launch But when you get to book launch number 20, book launch number 30, which I'll eventually be doing, it's so much easier. You know what to do. You know how to make your book a success. And there was a finding. There was a study done that compiled like, you know, like what are some of these things that a lot of successful authors have in common who self-publishing is their full-time income stream. The average person who is making six figures with self-publishing has 30.3 books in their catalog. So There is a lot of strength in numbers when you write that many books. And when you do write a lot of books, it's very important to connect all of them together. These are four of my more popular books, and it's because they are all connected together. They are part of the Grow Your Influence book series. I do recommend you do book series because that just makes it easier for you to get your readers to buy one book after the other, but you do want to connect your books together. So that may sound good, but how do we actually go in and write content for our books? So I'm going to break down the simple approach that I use to write all the books I write and expand in 2020 and beyond. And I think it just really boils down to basic habits that you do every day for your self-publishing journey. And the big one for me is writing 1,000 words every single day. It adds up very quickly. We're talking 365,000 words each year just by doing 1,000 words per day. And we're talking 18 books uh, just by writing 1,000 words per day. Something that doesn't take too long to do will break the numbers down a little more on how you can write 1,000 words every day. But if your books are 20,000 words each, which is what I recommend for a nonfiction book, we're really talking 18 books for something that doesn't take too much time to do each day. So more on the numbers. The average WPM, WPM stands for words per minute. If you were timed and at the end of one minute, someone looks over and sees how many words you typed, 
that's words per minute. So the average for people is 40. So at that rate, assuming you can maintain it, it takes you 25 minutes for you to write 1,000 words. Now, 25 minutes, 18 books. That sounds like something that doesn't take too much time, gives you very big reward. Now, the only catch is that you have to keep coming up with ideas because if you're scratching your head, you're like, what am I going to write about next? You're not going to be doing 40 words per minute consistently. So to make it easier for yourself to come up with ideas and stay in that state of flow, I always recommend people do a brain dump where you just list all the different things that you want to cover in your book. Then you actually structure them into an outline so that you know what course of direction you want your book to take. And finally, use something I like to call the Socratic method. Because the thing with you writing a book about something you're an expert in, a lot of the stuff that you write about, you're the expert. So you could overlook some of the questions that beginners have. So I know Scott has had a lot of people on talking about podcasts and that I, I'm a podcaster too. That's something I love. But let's say one of the things you want to cover in your book is monetize a podcast by turning your guests into clients. Like that's the tactic you want to cover. But there are a lot of questions that people would have if they're beginners, if they're intermediates, and you have to put yourself in that person's shoes and write down a bunch of questions that will lengthen your content. Like, how do I find potential clients for my show? That is something that some people are really good at, and it's easy to forget other people aren't as good as that. So how do I find potential clients for my show? And you can see a bunch of different questions. Some of these are super basic for, I mean, from my perspective, they're super basic. And from some of the people that Scott has had on the summit, like these are super basic things, but to someone who's reading the book the first time, they are not super basic. For some people, they may not even know how to approach someone to have them as a guest on your show. Like how do you ask someone to become a guest on your show? So rather than just ending it there as monetize a podcast by turning your guests into clients, think about all these different questions your readers can have, and that's going to give you so many more content ideas for your book. And one of the things about writing a book that really intimidates people is they think of the whole book. They think of this massive behemoth. And I know for some people, like using the word behemoth to describe 20,000 words, I know uh, if you're like a novelist out there, if you're someone who writes like a 200 page book, that's more like 60,000 words, 20,000 may not seem so bad, but it is still 20,000 words. So instead of thinking it as just this one big 20,000 word thing, think of it as 20 writing prompts. So going back to the previous slide, each of those three points is like a writing prompt and you just have 17 more writing prompts to go. And now all of a sudden you have an entire book done. And it's easier to do it in small chunks rather than viewing it as this whole work. So going back to this whole approach to writing books, because I, I did want to sidetrack to the Socratic method. There are some things you could do to speed up the process. One is 40 words per minute. That's the average. But if you get higher, if you get to 50 words per minute, 60 words per minute, it's going to have a big impact on your books. I know some people naturally aren't writers. They're more of a let's get behind the mic, let's do video, in which this is still great for you because you could use something like otter.ai to transcribe your work. And people talk at anywhere from 120 to 150 words per minute. The only thing though is there's usually more editing associated with like formatting and just you know, there could be some errors with the AI, but otter.ai is pretty good for the most part. And the thing that really stops a lot of people from writing their book is this need to be perfect. This need to continuously edit and look over as you're doing your book. So my advice is to only start editing, proofreading, all that stuff when you are actually done with the draft, because to go back and forth, back and forth is really going to stall the writing process. And one key point, I'll have a few of these key points that I want to emphasize. Shorter books makes it easier to write more books. My 26 books I have, they're not 26 200 page books. They're 26 like 80 to 100 page books. And people do like the shorter books. We'll get more into that later. But shorter books makes it easier for you to write more books. And for the person reading it, there are a lot of benefits. One is it's easier to carry. 
So I did a book signing for my book, YouTube Decoded, and there were people who were very happy with the size of the book because they could fit it in their suitcase. It was easy for them to put in their bag. And that's one of the advantages of having a small book that's also easier to read in one sitting. I don't know if you guys know the book Tools of Titans. I have read the whole book. I do love it, but that's like several sittings. Like you can't read Tools of Titans in one sitting. It's just something that's not going to happen. It's, and, it goes totally against where everybody's looking for these days, the pocket size stuff. Great book, but you're right, Mark. It's way too big. Yeah, I, I love it, but yeah. I mean, you got to think like, Again, think about that reader's journey. I don't want someone reading my book and like spanning it over months because then they're less likely to get it done. If you see that, you know, it's not that big of a book. It's not textbook size. I can finish it in one sitting. They will. And then what's going to be in the book? There's going to be call to actions. There's going to be that page one opt-in. There's going to be the back pages you can use to talk about your services talk about your social network. So it's easier then for the reader to take action. And then if you do get someone to quickly go through that reading experience and they're like, wow, I love this book, then it's easier for them to become repeat customers. Now with training courses, like if you sell one of those things for like $997 or $1,997, like you have to sell so many books just to catch up to a single training course sale. But you are able to quickly build a relationship with a book. People are not going to think twice about spending an extra three or $4 with you, especially if they use Kindle Unlimited where they literally spend zero extra dollars with you. And then it is building a relationship to the point where maybe this person becomes a client or buys that training course. So repeat customers can take the form of not just buying multiple copies of your book and reading them through Kindle Unlimited, but they could also take that effect of someone who does go into your coaching, someone who does buy your course and different things like that. You don't want to just think books here and you do want to keep Kindle Unlimited in mind because some people who read your book will read through Kindle Unlimited and it's literally effortless for them to just get your extra books and they don't pay any extra to buy your books through Kindle Unlimited. So I'm going to talk about no content books briefly. This is not something I do for my books, but it is something where if you really want to just publish book number one, or you want to publish literally over a hundred books each month, which sounds crazy, but it's possible. No content books is going to be that thing. So pretty much what you do is you take a page and you repeat it 90 times and there's your no content book. There are some authors who go super deep into this and they will look for keywords create no content books around those, even if they have no passion around the topic, as long as it is a popular keyword. I just want to show you guys this as an example, because it is something that some people may want to pursue. All you really do is you take some worksheet like this, like this is like at the end of my book, YouTube decoded, I have some worksheets that look like this. But if you just take those two pages there and you literally copy paste, copy paste 90 times, all of a sudden you have a workbook, you have a journal, you have one of these different ideas. Obviously, some of these like word search crossword puzzles are harder to do than others and may not make as much sense for your brand. But I feel like for a lot of people, a journal or a workbook could go really nice. Quizzes can also go really nice, but I think journals and workbooks work for a lot of people. It's just one of the different ways that you could very easily publish books in bulk without too much extra effort. Now, the one thing with a book is it's great to write it. It's great to, you know, say you got your name on it. Like my books in the background, I know Scott mentioned that at the very uh, beginning, but you do want to connect your books with one of your offers. Like you don't just want to put books into the universe, not thinking of how they're going to help your business because it's better if you're making an average of $100 per book sale because someone's becoming a client or someone's buying this other thing from you versus only making the book royalties. So you do want to plan out references throughout each of your books. And one thing that so many people forget to do is put links in your eBooks. Have the link to the affiliate offer, the resource you mentioned, the training course you mentioned, the opt-in. Because so many people, when they do eBook and paperback, they just think about the paperback format where you obviously can't use links but then people forget about the ebook links, which to me is a very missed opportunity for making more revenue with your book and just allowing people to know you better and visit different 
supporting pieces of content in addition to your book. Now, once you finish the book, you got to do post-production. And I feel like this is something that really messes up a lot of people, uh, not just in podcasting, but also in like YouTube and writing. It's that post-production because you're so excited, you finished your work, but now you got to go through some hoops to actually get it out. So the one thing I'll say right away, quality covers matter. Uh, you really could get a good one on Fiverr for as little as $5, but definitely do not skip on the quality cover. It's important to do research, look at books in your niche that are already out, and get an idea of what color styles, what types of pictures are on the cover, so you have a better idea of how to create a winning cover or you know what to tell the person on Fiverr what to do. Now, one thing you can also do for your book, and this is also a great pre-launch strategy to drive buzz, is to tell your community, your Facebook, your Twitter, your LinkedIn, a group of people, they will communicate with you. Have a few different covers and then ask them to say which is your favorite cover. And doing this makes your audience feel more involved with you throughout your book writing process. It gets more people to know about your book and engage because a comment could easily be say like, you know, I like book cover one or I like book cover two. So it's very easy to get people to comment. Like they literally just type in a number and then just like that, you've got more people excited for when your book comes out. Now, editing is also a part of the post-production. I know I have a different opinion on this than most people. A lot of people say hire an editor or you know, just hand it off to someone else. My preference is to just look over my work and publish it. And I only look over it once. The reason I do that is because I am more focused on getting a lot of books out. And like the more you write, it's just easier for you to avoid grammar mistakes. I'm not going to like, I, I, there, there's some still grammar mistakes. I'm not going to like, you know, like it's definitely something that happens, but it's better for you to get the book out sooner, get initial sales, get initial reviews. And the beauty of self-publishing is that you can literally go back into your book file and just change it. So I've had people like, you know, if someone reaches out and they say, I, I saw this on this page, I just go back into the file, I make the change, and just like that, it's brand new. And that saves me weeks of time. It saves me hundreds or even thousands of dollars because that's how much some people are paying for an editor and it's one thing to spend that much money when it's a legacy book that you are heavily pouring in your marketing, which we'll get into later, but it's another thing to spend that much money on a book where you know you have another one coming on the way, and if this book doesn't become successful, then you've got hundreds, if not thousands of dollars down the drain uh, because you did make that investment. So hiring an editor, uh, obviously some people will hire the editor and I'm just sharing my opinion on that. It helps me produce more books and be there for my community. Now, formatting is also something that takes time. This is one that you want to use the Kindle previewer to see what your book is going to look like because you don't want it to look weird. So that is definitely something you want to do. One of the things I like to do is once you have a format that works, you feel comfortable with it, you've got page numbers and all these different things, I use a rubric now to the point where I just copy a file of one of my old books and I just put in the content of my new book. And then just like that, I don't have to worry about formatting as much as I used to just because I have this formatting rubric in place. So once you find yourself happy with the way that one of your books is formatted and you like the style, I would just keep using that rubric and make it your signature style. So, I mentioned this already, that ability of changing your self-published book at any time. And it's not just for, you know, if someone says you have a typo, because I feel like none of us are perfect. I feel like there are books where even when they hire editors, like the content's not perfect, there's still going to be something in there. But being able to update your books isn't just for the ability to, you know, change a typo or whatever comes up. It could be you come up with a better offer. So one of my things is launch a podcast in five days, but I did not have this opt-in page in place when I wrote my book, Podcast Domination. So right now it's 
get a free ticket to the Content Marketing Success Summit, which is one of my evergreens, that's the thing on page one of that book, but it's not as targeted as a launch a podcast in five days mini course. So now what I'm doing is I'm going to change that first page so it promotes this offer so that it's more targeted and people are more likely to take action. And one of the final stages, but also most important when it comes to really nailing that post-production is the research and the optimization. Now, I recommend you do research before you even write your book because you don't want to write the 20,000 words only to realize, oh, this is a topic that people don't really care about. They're not searching for Amazon. You don't want that to happen. So I do recommend beginning this process before uh, writing your book. Publisher Rocket is going to be a really good friend if you want to do keyword research. And also Amazon Ads, which we'll talk about a little later, that's just going to be a really good friend, uh, a great resource. So in addition to using this to figure out what to write about, you want to put the keywords in the title and description, and you want to sprinkle them in the subtitle also. Like you want to have them in all these different places. So when someone is searching for like, let's say podcasting on Amazon, they are more likely to come across my book versus someone else's book. So you want to make sure you have the keywords in place. And you can see this is an example of the description I did for my book, YouTube Decoded. There are keywords in there like YouTube tips. But what I'm also doing in the description is I'm starting with a question. I'm giving them the promise. What are you going to get from the book? And notice how I'm using bold font and like bigger font because I want certain things to pop out. So Imagine what life would be like. I always do something like that for my books. I want the person who is reading that description to envision what their success is like. Envision the benefits. Uh, it's more about benefits and what the person can get and the transformation over different features of your book. So just a little later on, then I go into like all the different bullet points for what someone's going to learn in the book. And I cap off by giving them that call to action. I say, read this book now and unlock the benefits of having a successful YouTube channel today. So I'm really telling them to go get that book because they could read the description and then there's no call to action. They think, okay, let me just see like the also bought section. Let me see the sponsored book section and see what's there. But I'm giving them that call to action, which puts that idea in mind that you should buy this book if you want all these different benefits. So you do want to create a description that is going to grab attention while having those different keywords. Like again, how to make money on YouTube. And if you do use something like Publisher Rocket, you type in YouTube as like the keyword, like it'll populate with like dozens of different options. You can use competition scores, stuff like that. Now you think writing the book is the marathon. Like it, it feels like you did the hard part. And this is me, by the way, doing the youngest marathon, but the hard part for books, it's not writing them, it's actually doing the marketing. Because for too many people, you've got the scenario where you poured your heart and soul into this book only for you to realize, oh, my book didn't make sales. My book is struggling. Uh, it's not having the impact I want it to have. And marketing allows you to have that type of impact. Now, there are different marketing strategies based on what your overall strategy is. I have a stronger focus on revenue per book, which I want my books to make consistent, passive income. That is where my focus is. But there are other people who they want a legacy book. They want to hit the USA Today, Wall Street Journal, New York Times bestsellers lists. And then you, you're just building up for months, probably over a year if you want to hit some really big lists. And you're going to get dozens of people to help you with promoting this book at around the same time frame, around launch. A pre-order is far more important to do for a legacy book because you want to get on those lists uh, than it is for revenue per book. So for revenue per book though, and also for a legacy book, but this is something you usually see more for uh, when you're focused on making money from each book is using Amazon ads to get the evergreen sales because uh, in my case, like, you know, writing 26 books, I can't promote all 26 books. Like I can't, I can't do like uh, day one, this book, day two, this book. And then, you know, you got to figure out like, when am I going to promote my training course? When am I going to 
promote my coaching. So the Amazon ads really cover the evergreen sales for you. So you don't feel like you have to keep promoting your books and not promote any other part of your business. So we'll first get into legacy book marketing. Then we'll talk about the model I do where I just put out a ton of books and I'd rather see them make consistent monthly revenue. So we've hit on some of these points already. Have that pre-order. It's very important to use the pre-order because all of the pre-order sales that you make from a book count as week one sales. So if you get, let's say, 5,000 pre-orders over the span of like a year, that's 5,000 sales on week one. So any of these best-selling authors, you always see their books on pre-order. That's why. And the thing with a legacy book, which is the reason why I stay away from this, is it's an all or nothing book. You are pouring again, like probably a year into this book, not just on the writing, but also the marketing and the launch prep. And if it doesn't go well, it's very stressful. But if it does go well, you have a bestseller, you have a book that's going to generate a lot of revenue, help you with your business, likely get you on a lot more stages. And I think it's an appropriate risk reward ratio because you know there's high risk if it doesn't work out, but if it does work out, that's your signature book, the rewards are very high. So with a revenue book focus, like there isn't as much buildup. It's not like a year of buildup for a book or even a few months. It's more of like, and here it is. Uh, this is my book that I've been working on. I released it. This is it. And not all books are going to get the same love because if you publish one of your books the same time as you're doing a deep like PLF launch or something like that, then you're more committed to that launch of your training course or your coaching services than you are to your books. So some books are just naturally going to get more marketing than others. And if you do see a book outperforming, that is going to be a book you want to focus on more and just look for different ways you could promote that to your community. Now, there are some things you could do to continue to drive traffic to your books and get readers even when you're not promoting. That is doing free book promotions and 99 cent promotions also. And free promotions, obviously it's free. A lot of people are going to want to pick it up. You could also get your book on a bunch of uh, websites that uh, specifically help authors with their free book promotions. So that is going to be a really great way to revive some of your older books. It's a great way to get reviews. But the big thing with the revenue per book focus and just put creating a ton of books is it's not as big of a deal if one of them underperforms. It's not like an all or nothing legacy book. It's more of a book where, you know, if it doesn't perform, you just learn from it, you move on to your next book. But for some books, it makes sense to revive them. It makes sense to change the book cover, change the description, change all those things that appear on the sales page because that's what gets people to buy. The content of your book is what gets people to leave a good review. It's what gets people to engage with your brand beyond your book. But in terms of a getting sales standpoint and revenue, the, uh, the description's big. The cover is going to be the biggest um, factor as to whether someone buys your book or not. So there's definitely different approaches to the book model. But I feel like any author, regardless of whether you only have one book or you've got plenty, is to use Amazon ads for those evergreen sales. Publisher Rocket, I'm mentioning them here again. I might as well be their salesperson where you just pop in one keyword. You could even do by title or by author, which KDP does not let you do for those seven keywords you get to pick. But you can use those types of keywords for Amazon ads. You put in one keyword, Publisher Rocket gives you like 100. So a few different places you could go in addition to titles and authors. It's also good to look at the also bought sections of your book. So run ads for books that, you know, people have bought this book like from this other author and they've also bought your book. So the idea is that some people who only know about the other author now see your book and based on, you know, your book being in their also bought section it increases the likelihood of you getting that sale and also new releases because new releases can be potential like best-selling books, but they don't have that kind of awareness yet. People don't know about them yet. Like they're like the sleepers. Like you don't 
think too much about them, but then all of a sudden they skyrocket and then everyone's in a rush to run Amazon ads for them, but you can capitalize while a book that has this best-selling potential, has this buzz and engagement is still one of those new releases. And it isn't uncommon to have over a thousand Amazon ads going at once. I know for people who do Facebook ads, who do Google ads, this is like, this doesn't make as much sense, but for Amazon ads, if you have a daily budget set at like $1,000 per day, you're lucky if they spend 20, like don't quote me on those numbers because you know, it varies for each person cost per click. But in my experience, you like, I've got like ads set up where if they all spent their budgets, it would be thousands of dollars per day. I'm very lucky if Amazon spends like 10 or $20 in a given day. That's just the nature of their system. Now, the interesting thing with Amazon though, is that they have different regions. It's like, if you're, you know, US people, you know, you just have amazon.com. You think that's all there is, but there's amazon.co.uk. There's uh, an Amazon for Italy, for France, for Germany. There's all these different Amazon sites. And if you're only on ams.amazon.com, you are missing out on those other regions. So KDP recently gave you the ability to advertise on US, UK, Germany, that's been there for a while. But now they recently opened up France, Italy, and Spain, which are low hanging fruits, good opportunities. I like to use a tool called Bidex. It's pretty much like Hootsuite. Like if you guys know Hootsuite for like your social media posting, BitX works very similar. Instead of going into all six Amazon dashboards for all these different regions, you just have one central place in BitX and you are able to publish one ad to all of those different places. And another big thing for Amazon ads is to monitor them. Like you can hire someone to do this part for you, but I do recommend always keeping an eye on your Amazon ads and learning how Amazon ads work because it is your book and no one knows how to promote your book as well as you. So when you are monitoring your Amazon ads, you want to look out for a few, uh, like having a clump of ads that you're only spending $1 for, but they're not getting any sales or any traction. And those $1 ads can add up to like over $100 in ad spend where you didn't make a sale. So you want to be careful about those types of ads. I like to turn an ad off within like two weeks if it's just not performing for me because... Again, like I only want to focus on the profitable ads that are making a ton of sales. Now, the cool thing about Amazon is that you don't pay for impression. You only pay per click. So in theory, if your book gets a million impressions, but not a single click, you don't have to pay Amazon anything for running that ad. That's one of the cool things about Amazon. Now with the Amazon ads, there are a few different factors, uh, but one big thing that people think is that they just look at the overall numbers, but sometimes it could be just one keyword or two keywords that are really messing up your ad and hurting your profit. So you could have an ad with 300 keywords, 298 of them are doing fine, but two of them are really stinking and they're making it look like you have an unprofitable ad, even though if you just turn off those two keywords, you've got a profitable, robust Amazon ad. So uh, that's just one thing to look at which keywords are working, which keywords are not, and then compiling a list of different keywords that work the best for you. One of the most important things you'll need to know with Amazon ads is a cost. That's pretty much an indicator of profit. Uh, you want to have an a cost under 70% because Amazon looks at like gross profit. So if you spend $3 and you make $3, it's going to show 100% ACoS. It's going to show that you broke even, but Amazon's still taking 30% of the book royalties. So you do want to have something under 70% to reflect that. And it's just a good indicator of what's profitable, what's not. It's definitely a little more complicated when we talk about paperbacks because uh, each paperback is going to be different. Uh, but one key thing with Amazon ads is to be patient because Amazon's going to learn over time how to best promote your ads to get the right readers for your books. Now, one of the things, again, key point I want to bring up, it can bring a book back to life. If you have a book that isn't making any more sales, Amazon ads can bring it back to life, but you want to make sure you're picking the right ones. So a few things to consider. If you have a book that effectively promotes your business, 
had a good history of previously performing very well, has at least five reviews, and if it has those things going for it, it is a book that you may want to use Amazon ads for to bring momentum back with it. Now, I know there are authors who may not be happy with these things. They may not be happy with how the book promoted their business. The book may have never sold well in the past, and the book may not have enough reviews. So you could change those things. Again, you could just simply change your file of your book so that you better promote your business. And with how I was talking about my book, Podcast Domination and the five-day launch mini course, you could change the cover and you can also get reviews by following some of the things I'm going to share right now. So getting reviews, it is social proof. It's like saying, you know, you've got a big social media audience. Reviews are what people are going to look at before they buy your book. It's good practice to have at least five reviews before you tell the world about your book. Because if you tell everyone about your book and it's got no reviews, they're going to be like, why should I buy this? There are going to be some people who buy it just because they know who you are. You've given them a lot of value already, a lot of free content. Maybe they've read a book of yours or two, but the way that you're going to get people from Amazon who have no idea who you are to buy your book is through having those reviews because reviews are really an indicator of the quality of your book. So the way that you actually get reviews, you can reach out to friends and family. I do recommend doing that and eventually building up a list of different people who, you know, they've said, I'll review your book. That's good to do. But an easy way to do it, a hack that a lot of top self-published authors use is they will go in their niche and find a book that has a lot of reviews. They will go through each individual reviewer and if they have a website, they'll contact them. Uh, but if they don't have a website, which is very common, you can use LinkedIn to figure out who that person is as long as they provide a first name, a last name, and a location. It's ideal if they have a picture also because then you can match the LinkedIn picture with the picture of who left the Amazon review, but you can look through Amazon's reviews. You can look at Audible reviews. You could look at Goodread reviewers and reach out to those people. Let them know that, you know, I saw you reviewed this book. Would you be interested in reviewing my book if I were to send you a copy? Now, one important thing with the reviews and asking people is you want to give people the digital version. The reason behind this is because for assuming you're doing an 80 to 100 page book, it's probably going to be like $6 to ship each one out. And if we are talking about reaching that level where you have 30.3, let's just say 30 books in your catalog, because that's what a lot of these successful self-published authors have, and you want to get 10 reviews per book, like you see those numbers there. We're talking about spending $60 per book. We're talking about $1,818 for the entire book catalog. Again, that's just the 30.3 number, but it is an investment you're making per book to ship them out. And that's assuming that all 10 people who you send the book to actually review it, which that really doesn't happen. You're going to have to think more like tell 30 people about your book and then you might get 10 people to review it. Like you always want to expect like a third of the people you ask are going to leave reviews. And if you are sending paperback versions and you know, you want to hit 20 reviews, 50 reviews, a hundred reviews for all these different books, then it's just going to get harder for you to, spend all this money on your books to get those reviews. Now, as you get more sales, some of these reviews can happen organically. I like to ask people at the end of the book if they want to leave a review and you know, this is the link to do it because if someone makes it to the end of the book, it usually means they liked it. But again, like if you do paperback and you send them out that way, rather than the digital version, you are spending thousands of extra dollars in the long term to get all of your reviews for all of your books. If you have like one legacy book, then it may make sense to offer digital and paperback uh, to send out to people. Now, another big thing, this is more important for legacy books, but also important for any author is to get help from other authors. You can basically, that means like swapping each other's audiences. Like you email your list about my book, I email my list about your book and you do that for social media posts as well. You could do that for like podcast interview swaps. 
You can mention people in your books and they mention you in their books. One of the things that I do is I do book sponsorships where I say, if you want to be featured in one of my books in the future, it costs this much. And there are people who jump on that. Uh, you could also do review swaps. I only recommend you do this sparingly because I've heard of authors who they review other people's books and they do it too much. Amazon doesn't like it and then they can't leave reviews anymore. So I would recommend sparingly doing review swaps. It's not something you should do too often. Uh, it's better to use the other stuff to, that I mentioned to get reviews for your books. Now, finally, we have monetizing because we talked about you know creating the book, which most people think is the marathon. We have the marketing your book so people actually see it. Now, how do we make money other than the book royalties? So there are a few different ways. Uh, but it pretty much just comes down to knowing what your offer is and knowing how to present it. And you do this within the pages of your book. In all my books, I'm going to mention strategy call. I'm going to promote my other books. If someone pays me to get them featured in one of my books, I do that placement for them. I've been mentioning publishing ro publish a rocket way too much, but in a book that will actually be my affiliate link rather than just me mentioning it. And speaking gigs, you can use your book as leverage to speak on a stage. It's one thing to say, I want to speak about podcasting. It's another thing to say, I am the author of the book, Podcast Domination. I want to speak about podcasting. Books put you in that higher position, which makes it easier for you to get on more stages. So if you guys want to learn more about me, follow me on my journey. I do talk a lot about self-publishing on my YouTube channel, Mark the Birdie. Uh, we are really close to 4,000 subscribers, so that is definitely a big goal. We are pushing towards those three thumbnails or just some of the videos that I've done recently. Uh, I've already mentioned launch a podcast in five days or less. That is my mini course. The link is down below, markaberry.com slash five-day podcast launch. And I do enjoy talking with anyone who's uh, gone through my presentations or any of my content. So if you are interested in talking, definitely make sure you set up a free strategy call. It is a 20 minute call over at markaburry.com slash strategy. And once again, Scott, I'm just so appreciative of you uh, allowing me to share this presentation with your platform. Uh, I'm sure there may be some Q and I'm happy to take all the questions that I get. Yeah. Awesome job, Mark. Can you do me a favor? Can you put both of those links in the chat roll so that when I can put them oh, in? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I got to do that with the other computer, but I, I will get those in there. Okay, perfect. Uh, we got a couple questions here. Uh, let's see where was that here. Uh, chat, uh, Denise asks, "What about ISBNs? Is it is that is it that big of a deal to use ISBN through Amazon or another publisher that publishes on Amazon?" Um, ISBNs. That's not something I go as deep into. I just use what Amazon gives me because I'm more of a let me get the book out as quickly as possible. It may matter more when it comes to that legacy book and hitting bestselling list stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I got a question from Facebook asking, um, with you doing virtual books and then the hard copies, do you see success, or maybe you haven't done this, do you see success where you put your call to action on the very first couple slides, or a couple pages, I mean? Oh, yeah. I mean, I always do that for all my books. It's something you see a lot of people in the industry do because it is something that works very well. And the reason you put it on those first pages is because even if someone doesn't buy your book, when they preview your book, they get to see that call to action. So some people, just bonus tip, some people will say, enter your name and email address to get the free audio book of this book. So people think they're getting a steal, but it's someone on their email list. And I don't know, <laughs> like people who run Facebook ads, it's like, you know, if you get like $2, you have to pay $2 to get someone on your email list. That's in general a good rate. Obviously it depends on the business, but it's instead of getting a book sale, you're getting new subscribers. So that is what some people do. That makes sense. Uh, somebody asked, what, which of your books had the most purchases? Uh, for me, Podcast Domination is definitely the top book. And again, like that's why I'm going more into podcasting. That's why I have that new offer up. So when I see a book is outperforming, I frame my business more around it. I look back at that book, see what I can add to it to provide more value and create more opportunities. So that one so far. What, uh, what topic are you writing on now? More podcasting book? Or no? um, I'll be doing another podcasting book soon. The one I'm working on right now is how to make money selling nonfiction books because that is a topic that's done well on my YouTube channel lately. 
So now I'm just transitioning over to releasing another book in that area. Okay, cool. Cool. What other questions do you guys have for Mark Gaberti out there? Who's doing an amazing job out there uh, driving books. Loved YouTube uh, decoded. Great book. Um, you're, and you're right. The smaller books do well because it's easy to take with you if you're traveling. Um, I had a, a, a friend of mine who likes to take three or four of his books with him where he goes. So if he ever runs into somebody, he can write a note on it and hand it to somebody like a thank you card personally. And uh, I always thought that was pretty cool with, with, uh, with doing something like that. So something about it. What's a, what's a different way? What's a unique way that you've marketed one of your books that you didn't really talk about, but maybe something outside the box or a little crazy. Uh, one of the things that I did for my book, the wealthy author is I said, if you buy this book and you send me the receipt that Amazon gives you, yeah. I will give you this free course. So not only did it help me get more book sales, but it got more people into my course and it allows me to say, okay, I now know some of the people who bought my book. So come a week later, two weeks later, a month later, when they have finished reading the book, I can say, did you enjoy the book? And the person says, yes. I say, great. I would greatly appreciate if you could leave a review for the book. It would do so much. And um, here's the link. So you could just leave a quick review. Awesome. Can you go back one slide? So we wanted to write down that link real yeah. fast. I do have that. I, I, I just threw all three links in the Facebook live. Oh, I, well, for those that are on here on the, the Zoom, they, they're not watching on Facebook. Oh, all right. Yeah, that's the uh, five-day podcast launch. Hang on here. Let me put this on here. Five-day podcast launch. Okay, and it's HTTP market Bury. So it's a clickable link for everybody. All right. Good stuff there. Well, Mark, uh, any other questions before we let Mark go for the evening? I know you've got a busy week ahead of you. Uh, thank you so much, Mark, for sharing such great nuggets on here. You really did a great job breaking down and going through everything. Here we go. Uh, Kim, um, you have anything more about Amazon ads? Kim, do you want to um, go into that a little bit more? Or clarify? Uh, sure. sure. So Amazon ads, it's best to just pick one day to create a ton of them because Again, with Amazon ads, you're very lucky if you set $50 as your daily budget for an individual ad. You're very lucky if they spend $2 on that individual ad. Like I have some ads that I've created months ago where Amazon has still not spent a single cent. Like that's just like with Facebook and Google, like you tell them how much money to spend and they will spend it immediately. Like they will find a way to quickly spend that money. Amazon's different. So uh, it's very important to figure out what types of keywords are working. So, uh, I know for, um, it's like some of my books, like, you know, e-commerce is one thing that works for me. So I pick keywords in that space. So, uh, if you find like a general space that works for you with keywords, then I would suggest, for, uh, like creating more, like searching more keywords in publisher rocket that are framed around that keyword. Yeah. Is there an app or somebody that does that out there for you? Do you know or not? Uh, like Publisher Rock is just the one that, you know, you pop in one keyword, uh, a bunch of others come up. I do have an affiliate link somewhere in one of my YouTube videos because I feel like someone here is just going to be interested in Publisher Rock. So I do want to mention that in case anyone's interested in uh, checking more on that. Okay. Kim says, I need to write my first book. So this is all overwhelming. Well, it's overwhelming because you've never done it, but it's not that... I love how you broke down writing, spending 25 minutes or 30 minutes a day and writing a th how you write a thousand words a day. Yeah, think of it as like chunks. Don't think of it as this 20,000 word book. You're just writing 1,000 words 20 times. You are writing about one idea and you're just writing about 20 different ideas and then bam, that's your book. So now, not all ideas are going to be a thousand words. So maybe you add like an extra few, but again, think of it as just a series of blog posts that are organized, that have structure and, you know, one leads into the other rather than this gargantuan book. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. How important has your social media been? Cause I know some people out here have, don't have a Facebook page, don't have a Twitter. You, you need that aspect to kind of, I don't say crowdfund, but maybe crowd sell a, a first round of books maybe, or no. Is that helpful? I mean, so I think social media is really important, especially with how you use it. You don't need, 
a massive audience, you need an engaged audience. So I happen to have like massive audience on Twitter, on LinkedIn, these different places, and they're also engaged, which is really good, but you do need to have, it's more important to have an engaged audience because uh, I've been a part of like affiliate launches where like, you know, like some of the products that do like seven figures and they do affiliate competitions. There was one launch where the guy won. It was a big name launch and he only had a few hundred email subscribers and it's a testament to if you have such a super engaged community and you are engaging with like individual people within your community that could be even more powerful than a big email list Mm -hmm. yeah um kim says i thought that writing the book would be the main thing not the 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 marketing amazon ads look it all comes down to marketing The, the idea of writing a book to get a bestseller on uh not amazon but like new york where they make a book is such i mean i've got buddy money buddy of mine gregory huge author part of the thing and grow rich aspect of things you use the book as a lead magnet into other things more than anything else you know you yes you can sell products sell coaching that's a big thing but you're, you're not going to make a million bucks selling a, a, your book there kim you need to get out there get it down because it becomes the the business card. It says that it's like college, almost kind of like a college diploma these days. Hey, <laughs> I don't care if your degree was in, in basket weaving. It shows that you could spend four years and get through something eventually, right? It just becomes a business card. And the more you have, hey, this is great. You can go back. You can leverage it for your coaching. I mean, I've used this book, my book, sold or gave away a bunch of copies because it led to other things. Um, it led to speaking, it led to coaching let other things that they're and and Mark's leveraged this stuff and doing a great job out there, Mark. So really, really great stuff tonight. So any other questions for uh, Mark before we let him go? The links to both of those, I put those in the chat roll for being a Kim says, thank you, Mark. Um, Awesome. Good stuff there. Thanks, Mark. My pleasure. All right. Bye. All right. Don't go anywhere, everybody. Don't go anywhere because we